All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining. Tonight we have Sherry Martin Sosar with us, who has been an occupational therapist for 30 years, working for a variety of community and private practice organizations. In 2011, she opened her own occupational therapy clinic in Waterloo called Creative Therapy Health Services. Her team provides occupational therapy services for all ages and challenges in her clinic, community, school, or home. Much of her 30 years experience has included working with persons with traumatic brain injuries. Sherry enjoys developing creative solutions to the challenges encountered by her clients. For example, she uses mindfulness and yoga as part of the therapeutic process and has developed a yoga class for persons with post-concussion syndrome. Outside of work, Sherry enjoys outdoor activities including hiking, camping, and cross-country skiing in addition to tap dancing, reading, and teaching gentle yoga classes. So thank you, Sherry. And the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. So um, the topic for tonight is symptom management and everyday activities. Um, oh, bear with me as I figure out how to do this. For some reason, it's not letting me, Lex, go down a slide. Do you know how to make it do that? Um, do you have it in um, a slideshow, or can you just hit your arrow button to the right? To the right. Hmm. Or I have it in a slideshow. I guess we should have practiced this before. <laughs> Hold on. Um, if you click on your slide, will it um, move it over? There's something going on with my computer. Hold on, sorry guys. For some reason, it's not, even when I, there we go. Apologies. Okay, now it's working. So now let me just go back to sharing the screen. Sorry about this, guys. Is it sharing the screen? Not yet. I thought we had everything prepared. Okay. There we go. Okay. So thank you, Lex. Like you said, um, I have my own clinic, Creative Therapy, and it's all occupational therapy only services. And if you want any more information about the things that we do, you can um, take a look at our website at www.creativeot.com. Oh, what the heck? Sorry. Hold on. I'm just going to try something else here. My apologies. I'm not sure what's going on with my laptop here. But let's, I might just have to do it this way where you're going to have to see the sidebar. Okay, so as you know, the triggers, the triggers that happen, triggers that, your typical triggers to, ha, um, ugh, sorry guys, I'm feeling a little flustered now. Uh, <laughs> so typical triggers for causing symptoms like headache, dizziness, nausea, can include noise, lights, movement in your peripheral vision, computer time, neck pain, or things that involve thinking. So tonight's presentation, I'm gonna go through and address each of those areas. Some of them are things that occupational therapists can help with, and some of them are things that other professionals can help with. So my first thing that I'd like to um, talk about is posture. Posture is always my big go-to when I'm working with people. We don't realize how important it is to make sure our neck and arms are properly supported. Because when our neck and arms are properly supported, then it, then it, so let me just put it, phrase it the other way. If our neck is in a stuck in a forward flexed position, 
it's putting a lot of pressure on our neck, which then can cause us to have a headache. And if you're prone to headaches already, you really want to eliminate that pressure on your neck. So I'm gonna go through and show you a few, few ways to manage that. So the first is sleep. What I've shown here is if you'll notice in this posture, um, my back is fairly straight. This is what you want to go for when you're sleeping in your bed. So this is a good way to see if your bed is supporting you in the right manner. You wanna make sure your, your, your whole back is properly supported. And then you notice that there's a pillow between my knees. The pillow between the knees prevents the twisting of the spine. So you really wanna make sure your spine is properly supported all along the way. And then if you look at the picture where my neck is, I guess, oh, sorry guys, I'm trying to move my, so if you look at the, the um, picture where my neck is, I have the pillow properly supported and sort of hugging underneath my neck and my shoulder is supported uh, with a pillow. So this is all putting your neck and your body in a good alignment for sleep. And proper postural positioning for sleep is really gonna help you to get a better night's sleep and help prevent you from waking up with pain in the middle of the night. So here's a few fun different pillow options that you might want to consider. The first one is um, this person has is supported with a with a little memory foam um, thing underneath her neck, and that's going to put her in a really nice alignment and allow her to sleep either on her back or her side. The next option is um, making room for your arm. So if your arm that's on the, if you're a side sleeper and your arm is on the bottom is getting sore, this is the perfect solution for you. And this next one is called a McKenzie roll. And this McKenzie roll is great to help add a little extra support for your neck while you're sleeping, or to help uh, provide good posture for when you're sitting during the day. And that brings me to the next slide. So when you're sitting, you want to make sure that your feet are flat on the floor. Your knees and your hips are at 90 degrees and your elbows are supported. Why do you want your elbows supported? You need your elbows supported to take the weight off of your shoulders and your neck. So the more support your arms have, the less strain there is on your neck. And then if you look at the side view picture here, you'll see I actually have a pillow behind me, a little stuffed animal providing me with neck support. So you can replace that little neck stuffed animal with a rolled up towel with that McKenzie roll that I showed in the previous slide. But you wanna put something that's just gonna give a little bit of support in that little crook of your neck. And then when you do that, you'll find that, um, when you're sitting and you're sitting so that you're properly supported, you find that you get a better rest and less neck pain. And then on to how to sit at the computer. So it's really important, once again, your feet are flat on the floor, your hips or knees are at 90 degrees, you've got a good back support, you have that top of the monitor is at or just below eye level. The other thing that this picture doesn't actually show as well as I would like is the forearm should be supported. So once again, you want to make sure that your arms are properly supported so that it takes the weight off of your shoulders. So this is a, this is a nice sort of setup for a laptop. And the next slide I show you this is actually a really nice setup if you want to work at your laptop because it puts the laptop, it puts your eyes at a better level, but having the wireless keyboard allows your hands to be, um, allows your hand, your forearms to be supported. Then if you happen to be an iPad user or a tablet user, this is a great device. So this is a gooseneck laptop or iPad holder. 
And what it can do is it'll, you can have it positioned so that you can position it anywhere in front of you so that you don't have to be holding it up and you don't have to strain your neck. And then this um, cell phone holder is great because you um, it goes around your neck and you don't have to be holding it. So you can be looking at it without holding it. So if you're talking to someone on the phone, you're doing Facebook Messenger, um, it's a really great tool. The other thing, um, the other way that you can use the cell phone holders, you can just set it on the table and, it'll, and you can adjust it any way you want so that you can be looking at your um, cell phone while it's at, on a countertop or on your desktop. Okay, so I did promise that this is going to be about everyday activities. So when I work working with clients, I often find that they tell me that their symptoms get worse with a lot of bending forward. So the bending forward causes an increase in dizziness and can cause an increase in head and eye pressure. So one of the tips that I often recommend when doing Hey, Sherry, you're on mute here. You'll just have to unmute yourself. There you go. Thank or you. Don't know how that happened. Anyway, apologies. So when you're doing laundry, sitting on a stool is a really good way to prevent that bending forward. Laundry is such an awkward, awkward task to do and try to manage symptoms at the same time. But what I found is really effective is to sit on the stool and then reach forward. And if you find the reaching forward to be challenging, you can get long handled barbecue tongs that have silicone on them, and you can use those to help you reach your clothes out. So what I find is best is you bring your clothes out of the washer, put them in the basket beside you, then move everything over and then put the clothes from the basket into the dryer so you're not always going up and down. And the other important thing to consider when you're doing laundry is where you fold your laundry. Making sure that you're folding your laundry at the proper height. So a lot of people will fold their laundry on their bed. That's not going to be great for your back and your neck. You really want to, say, use the top of your your um, wash your machine if it's at the right height or find a table in the house if it's close by and you don't have to carry the laundry too far. Another fun trick, another fun laundry trick is if you have laundry on a different, on a, uh, in the basement, let's say, um, get a mesh laundry bag, put the laundry in the mesh laundry bag and then just throw it down the stairs. Easy way for transporting laundry down the stairs. A little harder transport it up the stairs and often I recommend that if you have a hard time carrying that you actually just have someone else help you carry the laundry up if you possibly can. And then on to dishes. Dishes is another tricky one because what happens when we're doing dishes is we tend to lean forward at the neck and we lean forward at our back. And that's just going to put, cause our body to have a lot of extra strain on it. So by putting your foot up on the little ledge at the sink, that's a great way to take the pressure off of your back, but also a great way to remind you to be straight so you're not getting that forward neck flexion. And then using a brush and holding the dishes up so that you're not bending forward. So it's, it's, it's a little sort of when you're doing with dishes, you kind of have to play around with it because keeping your arms up can cause pressure on your neck as well. So taking breaks or just changing your posture frequently can be a helpful thing to do. Uh, other tools that I really like to recommend, I often recommend to people, once again, to help deal with that bending forward problem. This is a telescoping bathtub scrub. This is a really handy thing to use to get at all the nooks and crannies in the bathtub without having to bend forward. And then the next, the, the, the uh, multi-headed brush system, it's telescoping as well. 
and it's battery operated and it has different heads on it. And I think this can actually be purchased at Walmart. Um, and you can use it to clean the toilet, you can use it to scrub the bathtub, you can use it to get into all the sort of nooks and crannies that you find it hard to reach in and help prevent you from um, bending forward. Oftentimes bending forward to cut toenails is a problem. So this is a long handled toenail cutter. You can find these at like Shoppers Drug Mart or Wellwise it's called now, can help with that. If you find that your vision isn't great, you can even get ones that have magnifying glasses over top of them to help you make sure that you're getting the toenail in the right spot. And then of course, blow drying your hair, trying to keep your hands up all the time is really hard. A lot of my clients, tend to just stop blow drying their hair or styling their hair. But this is a really handy device that you put on your wall that holds the hair dryer in place so that you can, you can just get your hair styled without having to hold the hair dryer up. Now on to um, the pacing and planning part of the, the evening. So I'm sure that you have all heard of the whole pacing and planning around um, around managing your symptoms. The goal when you're pacing and planning is to try to keep your symptoms in the green zone. So you can see here that I've got a blue squiggly line underneath the green, that there's the yellow highlighted area, and then there's the red zone. So your goal when you're trying to manage your symptoms is to always keep your symptoms under the green zone. So you're, so you're not triggering your symptoms too much. That's a challenge. I know that's a challenge. So then the, the, the true measure is to really avoid going over the red zone because when you got in over the red zone, then that can put set you back for a couple of days, right? Like you can often have a, a lot of my clients find that if they keep pushing themselves too hard, they get past that red zone of their symptoms, they end up in bed for a couple of days. So that's what we want to try to avoid. So one of the easiest, one of the tools that I teach people to do is to plan out their days. And in planning their days, plan in rest breaks. And I'm going to go through in a minute what a really nice restorative rest break look like. But it's really important that you plan rest breaks. If you have, um, if you need to, you can pre-plan your meals so that you don't have to make decisions if that's one of the problems that you have. Uh, put in your most important things that you have to do on the, in the day and then plan your extras around it. This is a challenge because I know that a lot of people that I work with find that they have more tasks to do in their day than they actually have the energy to do it. And that is always an ongoing problem. The goal is to try to plan your days though with as many rest breaks as you need so that you can manage your symptoms and keep them in the green zone. So one of the other um, sort of triggers for symptoms that I find people tell me about is thinking. Thinking really can um, cause an increase in head pressure. And the other thing that, the other sort of um, analogy that I like to use around all, around all this is the battery analogy. So, Pre having your concussion or acquired brain injury, you probably had a nice big full battery. Your brain, think of your brain as a battery. It's nice and full. It drains slowly and it recharges quickly. After a concussion, the battery tends to be smaller. It drains faster and it recharges slower. So it's about trying to manage that battery. And the more you carry in your brain, the harder it's going to be on that battery. So if you have, if you have in your mind, for instance, oh, I really have to call so and so today. Oh, I need to text my son this. Oh, I need to buy apples from the grocery store. Oh, you, you know, that whole running list of things that are going on in your head. The best thing to do is to sit down and try to write it out. There's a number of different systems that you can use for this. 
one of the symptoms systems that you can use if you i this is the one that i love i have a i don't know if you guys can see it there's a task tab on my phone and when i open it up so easy for me just to write in everything that i need to do that day i can put time on it i can put dates on it and then the, I know that it's out of my head and in my phone, and I know I'm going to remember to do it. If you don't like using the phone, use a good old fashioned notepad, but it's really important that you're not carrying all this information in your head that could be very easily carried out in a notepad or a phone. Then that's draining the batteries less. Okay. And then set up a quiet zone when you want to do your thinking. Okay, so if there, if you have something that you're really mulling over your head, like let's say you've got a big decision that you want to make and you're finding it hard to make this decision, find a quiet time to do it. Break the task down. And once again, get it out of your head. So make a pros and cons list. Use a decision tree. Do something to help get it out of your head and into paper so that your battery isn't having to carry all those extra thoughts around. So you really want to think about um, getting, the, getting the floating information out of your head and onto paper. When you're thinking, doing it in a quiet place, break down the task and write out the decision making um, pros and cons. There's a few other points here that I would just wouldn't mind going over too. Breaking down the task, that's a big one. And that's one that I find that a lot of people in their day to day life have a challenge doing. So for instance, learning a new recipe, I'll just use that as an example, because it's really concrete. The first thing you want to do is prepare yourself by reading the recipe. The second thing I would do is print the recipe out so that when you do each step, you can cross it off. The third thing is getting out all the ingredients and organizing them. And then you actually do the task. And then after you're done the task, reflect on the task. Did I do a good job? Did I make a mistake? If I made a mistake, how can I do it better? The reflection isn't about a judgment though, it's about learning from the process. The other important, um, another important tool in managing symptoms is mindfulness. So as we said at the beginning of the practice of the of this, um, as we said at the beginning of this presentation, I'm a yoga teacher and I've developed this yoga class for um, a mind, mindful movement and meditation yoga class. And I've developed it, developed it specifically for um, people with post-concussion syndrome. And some people find it quite helpful because it sort of teaches them how to slow down their breathing, how to concentrate and how to stay in the moment. So there's two, two different things that I would like to talk about with this. One is mindfulness versus meditation. So mindfulness is being fully present while you're doing a task. And that is really challenging for a lot of people with post-concussion because a lot of people with post-concussion have problems with their attention system. And if you can't pay attention to something, then it's hard for you to remember what it is you're paying attention to. So by being mindful and staying in the moment, it can help increase your attention and then help also improve your memory. But how does one stay in the moment? That's the challenge. So meditation is one sort of way of training your brain to stay in the moment. So if you have a meditation practice, even if it's five minutes long, it's starting to train your brain how to be in the moment. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is incorporating mindful minutes into your day. And I really like the mindful minute concept because you can do it anytime or anywhere. 
And what I often recommend is you start off with having a mindful minute while brushing your teeth. So maybe it's a mindful two minutes. So my, I use a power toothbrush and it goes for two minutes. So what I do when I'm brushing my teeth is I try to really practice on being mindful. I try to keep my thoughts on how the toothpaste feels in my mouth, the taste of the toothpaste, the vibration of the toothbrush, um, the floor I'm standing on, the temperature of the bathroom, it's usually pretty cold. Um, so I just try to keep my mind focused, but sometimes, often, my mind goes wandering away. So then I notice my mind going wandering away, and then I'm like, okay, come back to the moment, come back to the taste of the toothpaste, come back to the smell of the toothpaste, just whatever you need to do to bring yourself back to the moment. And there's many, there's a lot of different activities in our day that we can do that. And the more we sort of train our brain to be in the moment, the more we're training our attention. Some other ways that I, I recommend is when you're doing dishes, noticing the temperature of the water, the smell of the liquid detergents, the feel of the cloth, making the doing the dishes into a meditation as opposed to a, a task to be done. And finding other ways too. For instance, if I'm driving, I would try to be really mindful every time I'm at a stoplight. So I've tried to build these mindful minutes into my day so that over time I'm starting to learn my training my brain to sort of expand its attention. And then there's the meditation piece. So the meditation piece, the goal of meditation is not to slow your brain down or stop your brain from thinking thoughts. The goal is to notice that your brain is thinking thoughts and then bring it back to the present moment. So if you're taking time to do a guided meditation or you're doing your own five minute meditation, there's so many different forms of meditation. But the main thing is that you notice that I'm thinking this thought and you don't get caught up in the emotion of the thought. Don't caught, get caught up in a judgment of the thought. You just say, oh, look it, there's that thought. And then bring yourself back to the present moment. So there's a little sort of difference between the, the mindfulness and the meditation piece. So, and then bringing us onto that note is breathing. Breathing is such an important piece of the whole meditation mindfulness practice. But not only that, the breathing, if you do this diaphragmatic breathing, which I'll explain in a minute, it really helps to calm your nervous system down. So the more diaphragmatic breathing you can do, that it actually starts to relax your intercostal muscles because we tend to, when we're in pain, we tend to go like this. So this, this helps to counteract that. It helps to slow our heart rate down and it helps to stop the stress response. So when you're doing diaphragmatic breathing, I've, I've, just, I've done this little diagram here. And you'll notice on the inhale side, the chest expands as the diaphragm contracts. So inhale, actually, if you put your hands on your belly, as you inhale, you should feel your belly rise because everything is expanding as your diaphragm is contracting. And then on the exhale, you should feel the belly fall. So just try that with me for a couple for a couple breaths, putting your hands on your belly, closing your eyes, breathing in through your nose, feel your belly rise. Breathe out through the nose, letting the belly fall. Breathe in, feel the belly rise. Breathe out, let the belly fall. And then I usually take it one step further by saying, breathe in, feel your belly rise, chest rise, collarbone rise. Breathe out, 
Breathe out, let the collarbone fall. Chest fall, belly fall, and completely empty your lungs of air. Good. And then let go of any control you have over your breathing. Just going to talk through a bit more about this breathing. Um, breathing is such a great way to manage your stress response. And when we're in pain all of the time, obviously our stress levels are going to be high. So taking a few minutes, incorporating breathing into your day whenever possible is going to be really important. So I've found a little trick that's worked for me. I have this, I have changed my text messaging um, notification on my phone to, to have it to be a really beautiful chime. And then every time I hear this chime, it's like, it's, a very, it's so relaxing. I'm like, oh, I'm going to just take a moment to breathe. And I take a nice big inhale and exhale, a nice big diaphragmatic breath before I then respond to the text message or look at the phone. There's other ways that you could put it into your life as well. Um, the other thing is when you're driving at a stop sign, like I said before about the mindfulness, just other ways to think about how can you incorporate slowing down your breathing into your day. There's a few other types of breathing that I'll just go through with you as well. So there's square breathing. So this is breathing where you're gonna, so you breathe in for four, you hold your breath for four, you breathe out for four, you hold your breath for four. And you can do that four times. And that's a really good tool to use if you're finding yourself to be really anxious in the moment. So if you're finding that you're having a high anxiety response to something, square breathing can help because not only is it slowing down your breath rate, it's also making you think about your breathing. Another fun fact is um, the longer your ex if your exhale is longer than your inhale, it automatically slows down your heart rate and, and starts to to slow down the stress response as well. So a fun way to manage that is to sing. So if you have a favorite song, start to sing it. If you're not big into singing, another easy way to, a different way to um, get the same effect is to breathe in for three. So everybody try this with me. So breathe in for three, breathe out for four, Breathe in for four. Breathe out for five. And one more, breathe in for five. Breathe out for six. Once again, you should notice that that has helped to decrease your stress response. The more we can decrease the stress response, the better we can manage our, um, the better we can manage our pain. So staying on this little yoga slash meditation um, talk, that I'm, in this picture, I'm showing you what I like to call my restorative rest pose. So in this pose, you'll notice that my legs are supported on a chair. I've got a heavy blanket on my chest and I've got an eye pillow on my eyes. So this is a really great pose to do if you're having a lot of symptoms. If you're comfortable in getting into this position, it can really help calm the symptoms. So having your legs higher than your heart slows your heart doesn't have to work so hard to pump the blood around your body so having your legs above your heart is really nice and it's actually a really nice pose if you have any low back pain as well 
having a weighted blanket on your chest is much like the weighted blanket that people talk about and it helps decrease the anxiety and then the eye pillow you can either make it a little cool or a little warm not too warm and place it on your head and that pressure on your eyes can help relax and calm your eyes and if you stay in this position and you do practice those that diaphragmatic breathing I was talking about earlier some people have reported to me that it can help bring their headache symptoms down or some people will find that it helps prolong their endurances if they take a restorative rest break in their day they can actually do more things in their day because they've taken this break something to try but only if you feel comfortable getting into this position okay. so noise sensitivity so I've, I've got a list of other um, professionals to seek out for different things Noise sensitivity is such, such a challenge for people with post-concussion syndrome. And what I have found is there's a few different, um, um, one of them is called a calmer earplug, where it actually decreases the amount of sound going into the, in, that you get. And some people have found that it's a lifesaver for them and some people haven't. The good thing about these is they're not that expensive. Some people have used musicians' earplugs. They're custom made and they're about $250. The calmer earbuds are about $50. Um, I would recommend if, if noise sensitivity is really, really a challenge for you, I would recommend actually going to see an audiologist because they're going to figure out what the best system for you to use is. If you have tinnitus, you really should go see an audiologist because they, they have a number of different tools and things they can prescribe for you. So the, um, there's a tinnitus um, masker that you can put under your pillow that they often recommend. Some people have recommended um, hearing aids that can um, have tinnitus masking capabilities and also sometimes hearing aids can help with the noise sensitivity piece. The next piece that I'm, the next piece is the optometrist. So I know a lot of people will have um, issues with uh, movement in the peripheral vision can cause symptoms to increase. And this is really challenging if you're driving and you've got these, all these movements really quickly in your peripheral vision and then that can cause you problems. Or let's say you're hanging around with children, they're jumping everywhere that can cause problems. Or if you're having problems with um, watching a movie because of all the characters moving, or if you're having problems with um, not being able to look at a screen for too long, or not being able to read for too long, then I recommend going to see an optometrist who specializes in post-trauma vision, post-trauma vision syndrome. And there's some great optometrists in town that deal with this specifically and they'll they can recommend different glasses that might have prisms in them they can re recommend different tints for your glasses and will often recommend um will often recommend vision therapy as well to help with that then of course is always the physiotherapist so physiotherapist is a really key key player in in helping to manage your symptoms because they can help with the whole balance piece they can help with any neck pain or any other pains that you might be having. So there's um, physiotherapists that specialize in concussion management also in town that can really help with that whole balance piece, like I said, and just help in that in your rehabilitation process. I, I've had a few people come to see me in my clinic lately to help with their um, to help them manage their symptoms. And one of the first questions I ask is, are you seeing a massage therapist? Massage therapists can, if you have a really good massage therapist, they can really help release all that tension in the neck and also in your eyes and jaw. They can help really release all the connective tissue tension there. Another great person to see to help with your symptom management. 
Then there's speech and language pathology. I think you, I think Megan Battle did a presentation uh, for you guys last week, maybe, but they can really help you break down that cognitive piece. Osteopathy can also help, similar to massage therapist. And then I also have naturopath on here because often people with post concussion syndrome um, find that they have higher um, inflammation. And inflammation um, can be caused by diet and, and or can be helped through diet and, and, and supplements. And a good naturopath who understands concussion management can help with that. And how can occupational therapists help? Well, occupational therapists can help by helping you find the perfect sleeping posture, the perfect sitting posture for yourself. Everybody's going to be different. We can help you problem solve the right posture to use when you're doing your everyday activities. And we can help problem solve how you pace and manage your days. And then often when I'm working with clients, we then, once we get the symptoms under control, we then start to look at how can we increase your endurances. So what we'll often do is we'll often do different little tasks and goals throughout the week to help improve endurances. Sometimes I will help people with return to work plans. So we'll look at, okay, you can work for two hours and then maybe you can work for, um, with two hours, three times a week, and then we gradually increase that, but we look at what, how the symptoms are going, how we can, um, are there any workplace accommodations? Can we help manage with the fluorescent lighting that's in the workplace? It's just all kinds of ways that uh, occupational therapists can help people um, with their symptom management. And that's the end of uh, the presentation. Does anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to sort of reflect on? Anybody feel like there's anything they'd like to have any ideas about how to do something easier? Anything challenging in your everyday life that I didn't cover? Someone mentioned showering. Oh, showering. That's, that's a good one. So I guess it would depends on what, I guess it depends on what, um, your shower system looks like. So I would I would go in, I would look and see see what the showering system looks like. But I'm guessing that that I often recommend that there's a shower, that there's a seat for you to sit on when you're showering and that you have a handheld shower head um, that you can easily access, right? Those are two easy ways to do it. Is it the is it the arms above the head that's the problem? Is it the water the noise of the water? Can you share with me what's what's the issue with the showering? If anyone wants to turn on their mic, um, you're welcome to do so. I can also stop the, the recording if that makes everyone feel more comfortable um, talking and having a discussion. <laughs> 